All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get things underway here. First, I want to thank this month's sponsor, editor Britta Jensen. Uh, she is the sponsor of my free newsletter, Electric Speed, and the sponsor also gets a mention in the monthly free session. So if you are looking for an editor for your manuscript, whether it's a novel or a memoir, Britta might be a good fit for you. You can uh, book a free 20-minute call to discuss your project with her at the link you see right here on the slide. So that's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash editing free call. That will take you straight to her website where you can book an appointment. And that offer is good through the end of the year. Thank you to Britta. Okay, and now to introduce today's guest. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne is <Dang> someone. <laughs> hey, like these were like right on your Facebook profile, free, free, uh, free game. <sighs> um, I have known Suzanne since I started working in publishing in 1998 at FNW Publications, which was later known as FNW Media, which later went bankrupt, but we won't tell that story here today. At least I don't think we will. Um, and <laughs> so the photos that you're seeing here, I'm not actually in these photos, but these are some of our earliest colleagues, um, <clears throat> starting from Suzanne's early days. And everything that I know about contracts started with Suzanne. So when I was working for Writer's Digest, I was really interested in taking more of an active role in negotiating the contracts for the books. And Suzanne was gracious enough to say, yes, I will, I will mentor you through this. And I was always so grateful because I don't know where else I would have gotten the knowledge that started me off on, on such a strong footing. Um, I've, I found her tough, but fair. And there were never any stupid questions. And she always treated authors really well. Um, she also, obviously, because she worked at a publisher for, gosh, how many years was it, Suzanne? It's like 20 plus, 30? 28. Yeah. So a long time. She like knows where all of the dead bodies are. <laughs> she like knows. I was there to the bitter end. <laughs> to the very end. And uh, she, just, her knowledge is just encyclopedic. So I am so thrilled to have her here today. I'm go what's gonna happen is I'm gonna pass things off to her. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share. I'm gonna pass things over to her and she's gonna have uh, basically some foundational knowledge for you. And then feel free to ask your questions as we go. We, we probably won't get to the questions until the end or I might interrupt if it's on topic. So Suzanne, take it away. Yeah, all right. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for um, having me here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jane. It's good to see you, Mark. Um, and I just want to start off by saying that if you have a contract or when you get a contract, please, for the love of God, read it. <laughs> read it thoroughly. Read it two or three times. And do not be afraid to ask your publisher questions about the contents of the contract. Um, everything should be up for negotiation to a point, right? Depending on the publisher. So um, I have been for a little while now helping authors. You know, I did it for years and years on the publisher side. Um, I negotiated with authors. I negotiated with um, agents and lawyers, and sometimes with other publishers if we were like if there was a. Uh, rights licensing deal. Um, so I kind of have seen it from all sides. And so I have been using that knowledge to help authors who don't have an agent, maybe don't have the means necessarily to, um, to engage an attorney to look through their contract. Um, I've been helping them out for a, a nominal fee, um, kind of go through it and giving them advice on where to ask for changes, um, explaining to them what things mean, et cetera. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, um, from my experience doing it on the publisher side and doing it for authors, what I encounter a lot of. And one of the things I encounter a lot of are authors who really don't know what they're signing. And there is absolutely no shame in looking at a legal document and not being able to make heads or tails of it. 
unless you are a lawyer, in which case you should be very good at that. So oftentimes I find that people do not want to ask questions, they're in, whether they're embarrassed because they they think that, you know, their publisher is, you know, expects them to already know all this stuff. They don't. They know that you're not a publishing expert. They are expecting you to have questions and they want they want you to ask questions. They should at least want you to ask questions. Um, so please read and and use the internet. There are a lot of good books out there, a lot of good online resources out there for um, if you're not sure what something means, you can look it up. Um, so that's my first, you know, rule number one, you absolutely have to read the contract and you have to ask questions about it. Another thing that I, that I notice people not doing is they they really, in some cases, they haven't done any research on the author that has, on the publisher, sorry, that has sent them a contract. Um, they'll send me a copy of the contract. Um, and, you know, I'll take five minutes, 10 minutes, I'll start Googling, I'll start looking online, and I will find, uh, let's say, lawsuits that have been filed, you know, on, on both sides. I've found whole um, forums dedicated to authors complaining about a particular author. They're not getting royalties, they're not getting, you know, their book never got published, nobody ever responds to them. Um, those are things that you're going to want to spend a few minutes researching before you sign your the rights to your book away to somebody. You want to make sure they're a reputable publisher that other authors have enjoyed working with, or at least at the very least didn't absolutely hate working with, because, um, you know, those things are important. Um, let's see, go through my list here. Oh, quick question. Um, yeah, this question is from, <clears throat> excuse me, this question is from Ellen. She's wondering, are there specific search terms that you're using when you do that Googling around? <laughs> you can, uh, you can be as, as basic as um, the publisher's name and complaints, or the publisher's name and scam. Um, that will probably do it that that'll that's enough to really kind of take you down the rabbit hole. You can also go to sites like Reedsy. Um, what's the other site that I'm thinking of? There are there are blogs out there that have done a really great job of capturing lists of of publishers that you most likely want to avoid. Yeah. So um, we can, I'm sure that Jane has probably provided those names before. What's the other one I'm thinking of? You're probably- Writer uh, Beware? Writer Beware is the big one. Okay, yeah. yeah. Th yeah. That's one of the ones that I look at. Reezy is one I look at. Um, and then just join plain old Google search with the publisher's name and, you know, author scam or um, author complaints, that sort of thing. Great. Please continue. Sure. Um, so another thing that I don't really notice this this as much um but sometimes somebody will come along and have a really unreasonable expectation and i would say um a big part of the game at least when i worked on the on the publisher side of it was helping authors manage their expectations um anybody who comes along and and guarantees a particular outcome um that's a huge red flag because nobody can guarantee a certain number of sales, um, a certain level of royalties. Nobody, you know, unless they they have a crystal ball or something, they're they're not going to know. So that's a red flag. So um, so you you want to do a little bit of research to kind of get a sense of how many copies are are being sold. You know, on your topic, for example. What other books are out there that are kind of similar maybe to yours? How are those books selling? Um, in particular, how are how are that publisher's list selling? Um, you want to do, you know, you you you're not, you're probably not gonna get super wealthy. I you probably already know that, but um, you know, you're not gonna make millions and millions of dollars, most likely. So um, you gotta kind of go into it 
having reasonable expectations on how your book is going to, on what the what the likelihood is for sales. Um, another thing that you absolutely have to do is you have to ask for more of whatever. If there is an advance, ask for more. If there are royalty rates, ask for bigger ones. Um, if you know there are free copies, there should be. Um, ask for more of those. Ask for you know anytime you see a number on there, even if it's you know like uh, they're giving you, they're telling you in the contract that you have two weeks to turn something around to them. Ask for a longer period of time. Um, the worst they can do is say no. What they may do is say yes, or they may counter and and come you know meet you in the middle somewhere. So a little extra time, a little extra money, extra royalties, all of that stuff is great. Ask for it. Don't be afraid to ask for it. They are expecting you to ask for it. If a publisher tells you that the offer they're putting in front of you is their, their best offer, their only offer, uh, I don't know if you're, you know, that's not a great way to operate. I don't, I don't know if I'd want to work with them. So you should anticipate that they will make concessions for you and they will, you know, they will make changes for you. So don't forget to do that. Question. So, yeah. This, this is from Gail. She's wondering what if the publisher doesn't offer an advance? That's not uncommon anymore. I feel like if they're not willing to offer an advance, they should start with a, they should pay better than, better than usual royalties. I don't know if you agree with that, Jane. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's the least they can do is improve on the royalty rate but it's not uncommon at all for places to not pay um, advances anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. Now I know someone's typing this question as I ask it, <laughs> what, what is a standard royalty? And we, we can probably give a very large range that will try to encompass every eventuality. Do you, are, would you go out on a limb on this, on a royalty rate that's standard versus maybe- On no a royalty advance? rate that's standard or an advance that's standard? Royalty. Okay. Um, I mean, well, you've got to look at, are they paying on list price or are they paying on net receipts? Um, I would say that I see a lot of, I see more payment on net than I do list, but I do still see list. Um, and for trade sales, you really want to be starting at 10% Ideally, you'd be starting at 10% on retail. You're not always going to get that, but that is a good thing to shoot for. And that's as a starter. And, and another thing is, is um, if you ask for a higher royalty rate and they bulk at that, ask for escalators. Say, okay, well, how about after you sell, you know, 7,000 copies, you kick it up to, you know, and you kick it up another 2%. Um, get creative. There are all kinds of ways that you can get them to escalate your your pay, even if they don't increase the starting rate. Yeah, great. Okay. So those were kind of my big things that I just see happening a lot. People not reading the contract, not asking questions, um, occasionally having unreasonable expectations, or more often not being afraid to ask for more. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, if I can get my thing to work here, the red flags, huge red flags. Um, when you're talking to a publisher and you, it's kind of, think of it almost like, an, like a job interview. You know, when you, when you go on a job interview, they're interviewing you to see if they want you to work there, but you should also be kind of deciding whether or not you want to, you want to be there. You know, you both need to kind of be selling yourselves to each other, right? It's the same thing with a publisher. You may not want to work with it. You know, it's exciting to get a, a contract, to get an offer in front of you. Um, and sometimes people are blinded by that. And so they just dive right in, but not every publisher is going to be a good fit for you. And I would say for the most part, you know, I, I like to kind of approach everything with the um, idea that 
people have good intentions. And I think that's true in publishing. I think most of the people that you're going to encounter, they have good intentions. They want to do right by you. Um, but that's not always the case. So you have to be kind of careful and you have to make sure that the publisher is, even if they're, they could be, a, it could be a great publisher, but that still doesn't mean that they're the best fit for your particular book. So you really want to ask a lot of questions of them and find out how they operate. Um, what is their business model like? And you want to ask questions about, you know, how many of my books do you think that you're, do you anticipate printing or selling in the first year or whatever? What kind of retail price are you considering? Um, how, who handles your distribution? Do you do distribution in house or do you work with one of the big distributors? You, you want to ask those kinds of questions and a publisher who is not transparent with you, who is holding back on information like that, to me, that's a huge red flag. You want a partner. You want somebody who is going to work with you and not try to keep you in the dark on what's going on. Um, any book is going to be more successful if the publisher and the author are working together for the best possible product, the best possible marketing, et cetera. So look for a publisher who is transparent in um, how they're going to be handling your, your book. Another red flag I mentioned over promising earlier, um, over promising is a huge red flag. Nobody can, nobody can tell you how your book is going to perform. They're going to have a number that they're going to shoot for. They're going to base it on feedback from their salespeople, you know, feedback from the accounts that they work with. Um, they're going to be doing a lot of digging to try to figure out, to, to get a sense of how they think it's going to perform. And they're not going to move forward with it if they think that it, unless they think it will perform, but they cannot guarantee anything. There have been books that we thought were going to be huge sellers that sold nothing <laughs> practically. And then there were books that, you know, we thought we we're going to just print a few thousand because this doesn't have a huge audience. And, and then you're, you know, within a week you're printing 10,000 and then another 15,000. You just never know. So nobody can make any kind of guarantees to you. And if they do, that's a problem. Um, another red flag I mentioned, um, negotiating everything and publishers who say that this is the only offer that you're, you know, this is our final offer, our best and final, that's a red flag to me too. They should be willing to work with you on negotiating your agreement. So those are the red flags. Any questions on any of that? Yeah, here's an interesting question from Damien. He, he's wondering if there's a general or reasonable amount of time that's given to an author to understand or respond to the contract? How long in your experience does that negotiation process take? In my personal experience, it has taken months before. It depends on, it depends on the asks mm -hmm. and it depends on how, how much the publisher wants to work with them. Um, but it, they should be willing to give you as much time as you need. If they feel like you're just kind of jerking them around, if they feel like there are sometimes people have multiple offers and they want an opportunity to review all of them, which is legitimate. But if they feel like you're dragging your feet because maybe you're using their offer to improve a, an offer from somebody else, they may get frustrated with you and um, they may try to, to press you to make a decision, but you should not be able to, you should not be afraid to take as much time as you need to dig into it and make sure that you want to sign it. Um, just like anything else, a high pressure tactic, somebody who tells you that you have a very limited time, oh, we, we need you to sign this today, or we need, we need a signature within the next couple of days, I would run from that because um, no reputable publisher is going to use a pressure tactic like that to try to get somebody to sign a contract. Yeah. That's yeah. another red flag. Yeah. In my experience, the, the bigger the publisher, the slower they are. <laughs> it's yeah. usually the agent or the author who's trying to like move things along so they can get that first payment. Well, um, you know, and something to consider is that depending on who you're talking to, you may be working with an employee who then has to clear. They may they may have authorization 
to make certain types of adjustments to your contract, but anything beyond that, they're going to have to go through multiple levels of approvals. You know, they may have to go speak with their legal team. They may have to check with, you know, their boss and that stuff can take a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it can, it can drag on and it can, it can get kind of annoying actually, but, um, just hang in there and don't be afraid to take as much time as you need. Great. Um, I was going to talk a little bit more. Let me open this up some, um, I've already talked, go ahead. Sorry. There, there was a question that just came in about, uh, preemptive offers that are time sensitive. And I would say the conversation we're having now is after any sort of preempt or like auction or wh whatever, usually those sorts of deals, you know, you're talking about high level points or deal points rather than the particulars of the contract. Did you uh, ever have to deal with that high pressure situation yourself, Suzanne, with a preemptive Me? offer? Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't, you know, no, I don't believe I did. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, and you guys, if I'm speaking too quickly, please let me know. And I will try to slow down. I can be a bit of a fast talker. Um, so back to researching the publisher, we talked a little bit about that. So some of the things that you want to understand from your publisher is, you know, look at their list. If you haven't already, what are the other books that they're selling? And do you feel like your book is a good, um, you know, does your book fit in that list or is there too much competition for your particular topic? Are you, you know, if your if your book is on their website, along with all of their other titles, are you going to be okay with that? Are you going to be embarrassed about some of the stuff that, you know, your book might be, um, promoted next to, um, how do their books sell? Where do their books sell? Can you go into a bricks and mortar store and find books with that publisher's imprint on the spine, or can you only find them online? And there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. If that's the case, as long as you understand that that's what you're, that's what's happening. Um, some publishers are pretty much only have an online presence. Some of them are only um, ebook or only print on demand. You want to understand exactly how they're going to handle your book. Will there be a print run? All of that stuff. Um, you want to do their books look good? Are they are they well designed? Is the editing good? Do they look professionally done? Do customers complain about editorial mistakes um, on Amazon if you're looking at reviews on their titles? You want to take it, you want to consider all of that stuff. Um, I also recommend that people, one of the first questions I ask people that come to me looking for contract help is I want to know what their goals for the project are. What are your primary goals? Sometimes I'm working with people who just need an academic publishing credit and it's for their career. Other times I've dealt, I've worked with people who own a business and they are looking for an opportunity to maybe, um, you know, pro help promote their business. And they're going to, they're going to be, their plan is to do a lot of speaking engagements. Um, sometimes it's just like, Hey, I want to leave a legacy for my kids. You know, I, kids are the only read it I'm fine with that but you know I I want to I can't afford to self-publish it and I want people to read it I want it to be available sometimes it's as simple as um you know I want um my arch nemesis from high school to see my book in a bookstore and feel really bad about herself you know like there's whatever it is you need to kind of understand your own motivation for getting your book published because it's going to inform how you approach the contract the the academic who just needs a credit for their career in academia, they may not care as much about the royalties, for example. They may be more focused on other other elements in the contract. And there's a lot of give and take. If you when you're negotiating, if you want something 
over here, you may have to give something over here. I'm using my hands. You probably can't see that, but um, you know, you, there may be some give and take. So you have to kind of understand where you're, where you, what you need and what you're willing to kind of give up to get that. Um, let's see. I'd be interested in hearing from people who do have a, a reason that they want to get published that isn't necessarily just about selling books. Um, if anybody has anything they want to throw up there, Jane can tell me about it. Um, so you want to gather information about their plans for your book. I talked a little bit about that already. How many are they going to print? Are they going to print? Um, is it going to be a hardcover? Is it going to be a paperback? What kind of retail price do they think they're going to get for it? You want to know all of that stuff up front, if possible, because it's going to help you figure out if there is an advance, it may help you, it may help reassure you that you can ask for more money for one thing. Um, it, it used to be in the olden days that there was a formula for this kind of thing where it was the number of books printed times the retail price divided by the discount. Um, and then, you know, whatever that number was, you would take a quarter of it or a half of it, and that would be what the publisher would use for the advance. Um, I don't think that really holds true so much anymore, Jane. Would you agree that yeah. it's just kind of all over the place now? Correct. Um, but it's still kind of good to get a sense going in what kind of pricing and print run they're thinking of. I'll maybe I'll Marketing. work in. I'll, I'll work in a question here. There was a couple okay. questions that kind of trickled in about how you determine how well a publisher's book is selling without, say, access to BookScan, which most authors don't have. So how would you go ab about figuring that out? Send them an email. And, you know, if you have a contact there, you know, develop friendly contacts with people that you work with along the way, because those people can be instrumental in helping you if you have problems or questions later. So develop friendly relationships, reach out and just say, hey, you know, I was just wondering if you had any kind of insight into how my book's performing. Um, what about and they will prob probably share, pardon? What about before you have a contract? <clears throat> like when you're- Oh, you mean there are other books? Oh, yeah. that's a good question. I mean, you kind of, I, again, I think you just ask, you kind of have to rely on them to be honest with you, but that is an interesting question to ask people. What do they consider a success? What does, what does success look like to them? Is it selling 10,000 copies or is it selling 5,000 copies or maybe even a thousand copies? Yeah. Um, you could get wildly different answers. So it is definitely good to ask that question. Um, you know, how many, how many copies have they sold of their bestseller? You know, um, that's a good one to know, to ask. But I'll yeah, offer, you just have to, yeah, I'll offer reassurance that when I was an editor and someone was brave enough to directly ask me those questions, I did answer them as honestly as possible, because like you said, I wanted them to have the right expectations. It was usually yeah. lower than they thought. <laughs> yeah. 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 I did too. Anything that people asked me, I would give them an answer to, you know, maybe sometimes I shouldn't have, but, um, you know, it's, I wanted, you know, the, the goal of a contract should always be both parties walking away from it at the end, feeling good about what they got. If one party comes away from that negotiation feeling like they got screwed, it's not a good contract and you're going to have a problematic relationship going forward. So it, it behooves nobody to have or to have a relationship that is going to be adversarial or, you know, weird in some way. So you may as well just put it all out there, give them all the information so that they can make the right decision for them. And, and then you're much likely to have a positive outcome all the way around. Um, so let's see, where was I? Um, so I told you to oh, talk about your, ask them about marketing. What does their typical marketing plan look like? 
it may be very little. It may not be much at all, but you want to start having that conversation with them. What are they going to do to help sell your book? What are they going to expect of you to help sell your book? Because in a lot of cases, they're going to be leaning more on you than you might like. Um, publicity and marketing is very expensive. Um, you know, big publishing houses are going to do it if they, you know, I, I mean, even then they probably pick a certain number of books. They probably have a list that gets, these are our A marketing efforts. These are going to be the B marketing efforts. Um, but you want to kind of have an understanding going in on what that might look like. And then you want to make sure that some of that gets worked into the contract if possible. They may not want to, they may not want to commit to it. Um, but you should ask anyway, because you just never know. They, maybe they'll say, yeah, let's do it. Um, okay. So I was going to kind of dig in a little bit into some of the clauses that you really want to, and some of the things in contracts that you want to pay attention to and make sure are there. Um, termination language is a big one. I feel like this ends up causing problems for authors who did not read the contract or fully understand what they were agreeing to a couple years in, five years in, they want to, you know, they want to cancel the contract. They want their rights back because they're not happy with some aspect of how sales are going or what have you. And there may not be an easy mechanism in place for them to do that. And then they're very upset. So you want to understand exactly what steps need to be taken and under what circumstances you can terminate your contract. What's likely to happen is that you're going to get a contract that spells out all of the ways in which the publisher can cancel it. And it's going to be pretty much for any reason at any time almost. And it will be very brief on the author's um, avenues for cancellation. So look at that. And that is one area where I, I advise everybody to push back and try to get some language in there to make it more clear and more, um, you know, and, and more fair. Um, you should be able to terminate that agreement if they're not selling your book anymore. There's, you know, you'll, you'll probably find like an out of print clause. And I see this a lot in contracts for publishers who don't print. They don't, they do print on demand and ebook only, and they will have it out of print language that says, if we take your book out of print, if we stop, if we stop um, selling it, no, they don't say if we take your book out of print, they say, if we stop offering your book for sale, that's the language they use. If we, it used to be that they, they had to have inventory. And if they didn't have inventory and they weren't going to order any more inventory, that was when the author could say, okay, I want, you, you know, I want my rights back. And usually the contract would say that the, uh, the publisher had six months or something to make an edition available again. And if at, at that time they didn't, then the rights would revert. But now it's just kind of tricky. And it says, if we stop offering your book for sale, well, having your book available for sale on the publisher's website, in my opinion, if they're not actually selling any copies is not a great reason to hold your rights hostage. So I advise people to, try to modify that clause so that if it's only available in, in um, ebook or print on demand that you get your rights back. They'll probably bulk at that. And if they do, okay, well then how about if they're only selling so many copies per royalty period for two consecutive periods? If you can only sell 10 copies a year or 10 copies a quarter or whatever that number looks like to you, um, or it could be based on actual royalty earnings. If I'm only making $50 a year in royalties for two consecutive royalty periods, I want the opportunity to get my rights back so I can do something else with the content. Um, does that sound reasonable to you, Jane, in all of your experience? 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you can ask, and that's just kind of another way to say that you can ask for things. And if they say no, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the end of it. Go back and ask for, ask for it another way, you know, how get creative on other ways to kind of accomplish your goal. Um, so yeah, out of print language, termination language, you should look for that in your contract and make sure that it works for you. Copyright language. The copyright should say that it's going to be in your name, full stop. Um, and it usually does, but I have had circumstances where I've seen contracts where it's the author's intellectual property, but the publisher has decided that they should be the ones to own it. To me, that is a non-starter. It should be a non-starter unless you have a work for hire situation where, you know, they've, they're asking you to write on a particular topic and you're just kind of, you know, um, it's, it's not your, your story or, you know, your work. So I get, I mean, I guess even then it's still your work, but, but there, there could be reasons why the publisher could reasonably expect to own the copyright, but 99% of the time it should be in your name. Um, first refusal or option language. They will probably have a clause in there that says they get first crack at your next book. I always advise people to strike it all together, strike that language. And then if they say, oh, we can't strike it, then try to fine tune it so that you have a little bit more control. You don't necessarily want a situation where you're required legally to give them your next book to publish because you may not want to work with them again. Um, you should want it, you know, if you want to work with them again, you'll, you should just be able to do it on your own and not um, just have them say, oh, I'm sorry, we want your next book and you you know, you can't take it elsewhere. Usually there's a lot of weird stuff in there that you can kind of play around with. Um, you know, you may be able to get out of it if there is option or first option or language in there, but, but just to be safe, just strike it if you can. Are we okay so far? Anybody have any questions on any of that? You're good. Okay. Um, let's see, we talked about royalties, find out if it may, you know, check the language to make sure it defines, um, if it's, if they're paying royalties on that receipt, you should look to see how they define that receipts. Um, if it's retail price, it should say retail price. Then you want to make sure that those royalties are in line with the industry standards as, as much as standards apply anymore these days. Um, you can use the, um, the Authors Guild, you know, there are places that you can go to kind of figure out what is what is fair. And if you're, if they're offering numbers that aren't in line with that, ask, be sure to ask for more. Even if they are offering numbers that are in line with that, ask for more anyway. They may say no, but they may say yes. Ebook royalties. Your ebook royalties should not be lumped in with everything else. You know, often there will be a clause that says, okay, for copies sold into the trade at such and such discount, your royalty will be 10%. Um, for copies sold into the specialty market or sold at a higher discount, it might be a 5% royalty. Your ebook royalties should be separate from all of that. And you should be shooting for 25% if it's not already there. I have seen some cases where the publisher lumped everything into one bucket and said for any sales that it would be a 10% or seven and a half percent or whatever royalty rate. And your, your ebook royalty definitely needs to be higher than that. Deliverables. Your contract will spell out all of your obligations and all of the publisher's obligations make sure you understand what, what your obligations are. Um, you know, they're gonna want you to submit the manuscript, obviously, in what format does that need to be submitted? What else are they expecting with the manuscript? You know, there's all the front matter there, you know, do they want an index? Do they want, um, you know, are there illustrations? 
Um, how do they handle permissions? You want to make sure you understand all of the things that you are saying that you will deliver with the manuscript. And you want to make sure you understand when those things need to be submitted and make sure that you can actually abide by that timeline. If you feel like they're giving you a very short time to get the material in and you're not comfortable with it, talk to them about it. If they're adamant in keeping that long, that same timeline, it could be because they have a hole in their schedule that they're trying to fill. That actually might give you a little bit of leverage. I feel like if they're asking you to, to submit the manuscript in a short time frame that is that you've already suggested you're not super comfortable with, that is an opportunity for you to ask for more money because chances are you're going to have to put aside other things in your life to get that manuscript done on time. So make sure you're compensated for that. Um, and then make sure you understand all of the things that it spells out all of the publisher's obligations to you and your book so that you can hold them to those things. Another thing you want to look for is language that is vague, um, muddy language where um, let's say that, you know, something I see a lot is, you know, that you're the, the author will, you know, the publisher is going to send the copy edited manuscript to the author and the author will make corrections and return it to the publisher within a reasonable amount of time. Well, what's a reasonable amount of time to, you know, it could be very different for either party. So try to re remove anything like that and actually replace it with a time frame so that everybody's on the same page and understands what the numbers are. Um, because otherwise you could find yourself in a situation where there's vague language that you, the two parties don't agree on what that vague language means. And so then it goes to a mediator or a court to decide. And you wanna avoid that as much as you possibly can. So anytime you see anything that's not clear cut, try to make that clear cut. Um, under, another thing I want to talk about is understanding what your deal breakers might be because you can walk away from a contract if you, if there are things in that contract that you're uncomfortable with, you should not, you know, a lot of times people feel pressured to sign. They feel like, oh, I never even in expected that I would be lucky enough to get a contract. This may be the only one I get. So I, I better, you know, I'm uncomfortable with it, but I'm going to sign it because I want to be published. You know, I mean, that's, that's understandable and that's fair, but there, there is, there is a chance that if you walk away from something that you, it may take a while to find somebody else who wants to publish it, or you might end up losing your opportunity to publish it. So you need to be very clear with yourself about where you are going to draw the line on the, on the changes that you need in the contract. Um, sometimes it is advisable to walk away from something. Um, so think about that. Okay, some of the tips, I've already gone over some of this, but you know, always ask for more of everything. There's no shame in that. Um, get creative when you're asking for changes. If they say they can't do something, ask why. Why, you know, why are you unable to do that? It may help you understand another way to kind of accomplish that same goal, right? They might not be able to, you know, one example would be, this happened to me a lot when I was negotiating for publishers. Um, I would have an author that would say like, oh, I want, a, I want a better discount. I want the author discount to be, you know, 65% instead of 50 or 55 or whatever we were offering. And I really could not agree to that because of the way that our, let's say that our system, that our workflows were set up, right? So I would, I would then say, you know, I can't give you the higher discount, but I could add X number of extra free copies to your, you know, you should get free copies when your book is published. 
if you, I would give them extras and that would often make up for the fact that they couldn't get the higher discount. So think of things like that. If, if you can't get the change you want one way, see if there's another way that you can kind of go about it. Um, so this is going to sound weird possibly, but, um, if, you know, a lot of us struggle with things like imposter syndrome, and we are not comfortable advocating for ourselves, it's, you know, it's always much easier to advocate for somebody else. So if you are someone who is not feeling comfortable asking for more for yourself, try to practice that with somebody. Talk to a friend, you know, sometimes you do like um, mock job interviews with friends. Um, do a mock contract negotiation with someone that you trust to try to just hear yourself asking, hear them saying, oh, no, I can't do that. And then coming up with a plan for how you're going to counter things. Also, try to negotiate with the publisher in the way that you're most comfortable. Some people are do not want to get on the phone. They do not. You know, that's a lot of pressure for people to be on the phone with someone asking for more money or whatever it is, then try to just funnel everything through email if you're more comfortable going that route. If you don't like email, then try to get them on the phone to schedule a call. I actually think that a good thing to do is to do both of those. Maybe send them an email with questions, things like that, and then say, hey, could we schedule a call where we could talk about some of these things if you're comfortable doing that? Um, I think I might talk to... Oh, I, I was just going to suggest, since we have so many questions, we could just, uh, if you want, we can segue to just total Q&A. Yeah, like. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Actually, I would love that. <laughs> okay. Takes the pressure off me a little bit. Okay. Excellent. All right. So give me just a second. Uh, Gail is wondering if you think there's much difference between the children's market and the adult market when negotiating contracts. Um, I don't know, to be perfectly honest, I feel like, <laughs> yes, there probably is somewhat. I know that with the children's market, you're going to be talking a lot more about art and things like that, illustrations. Um, and I know that there are differences in the industry. There are differences between, you know, how different publishers approach things. So yeah, yeah there probably are going to be some, some differences. And again, that's where research is your friend. Um, talk to other people that other children's writers who have been published, um, reach out to, um, you know, writing groups where maybe they do a lot of writing for children and find out what kind of experience they have and just dig around online as much as you can. I know one of the big differences is that if it's a picture book, you're often splitting the royalty with the illustrator and the royalties yeah. tend to be lower generally for children's books. So that's something I would expect. And the, um, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, it's possible they have a model contract somewhere like in their archive of resources. I would definitely check that organization out if you haven't yet, Gail. All right, next question. Bobby's wondering about the legal review that the Authors Guild provides. So for those who aren't aware, Authors Guild members, if you're a full member, not there's an emerging member level where you wouldn't qualify, but if you're otherwise a full member, they do have a legal department that looks over book contracts. She's wondering if, if their review is enough or if you should actually engage another person like a lawyer or someone like yourself, Suzanne, to take a look at it. I, and you may not be familiar with their services, but I can speak to it if, if needed. Yeah, I, I am not. I, I have not seen what their reviews are like. I've, I've seen a little bit and they tend to be very tough, but they're not going to negotiate it for you. So I think the important thing to realize is they can tell you all of the things that they would fix, but it doesn't mean that they're going to get fixed. <laughs> and yeah. I think 
it's still on you to be creative or to come up with creative solutions. So I think they're good for telling you if there are red flags or if there are things that aren't normal, but then you still have to go through the negotiation process. And if, and if someone has the means to have an attorney or someone else look at the contract, even if you do get a review through the, the Writers Guild and it's a great review, if you have the means to do it, have another set of eyeballs take a look at it for you. Yeah. It cannot hurt, but it can be helpful. Yeah. So, and different people look at it from a different perspective too. You know, lawyers, when I would work with lawyers, lawyers would be looking at a contract specifically from, you know, they would be looking at legal language and not necessarily, um, you know, the things that the author really cares about. So you kind of want to um, make sure that all of your bases are covered. Angela says, I hear the term rights all the time, but what does that truly entail? And I think this is where authors sometimes get confused about copyright versus like all of the rights that are mentioned in the contract, like subsidiary rights or North American yeah. rights or whatever. Yeah. I mean, chances are good that any contract that you're looking at is basically going to say that you're granting to the publisher the exclusive right to the book con book content in all formats, in all languages, um, you know, whether it's subsidiary rights, film rights, um, foreign language rights, you know, everything. Now it's your, you created it. And, and I, sh I should say that those rights go to the publisher for the life of the contract only. Um, you can at some point get those rights back. And as the copyright holder, you know, you own, you, you know, you own that copyright that they can't take that away from you. Um, so there, you know, it can be a very confusing aspect of the agreement for people. There was a question about the rights for TV movies. Um, Carolyn's wondering if it's possible to retain those rights. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible to retain, you know, you can always ask for things to be struck from the agreement. Mm -hmm. um, some things they will be fine with striking, other things they will want to hang on to. If they want to hang on to it, they should have a good reason for it. If you want to retain movie rights and you strike it and they come back and say, oh, no, we want those. Well, why, what, you know, what is your track record like with movie rights? How many, how, you know, how often do you license movie rights? You know, they should have, they should have an explanation for you on why it's so important for them to keep them. And if they can't give you one, then, you know, try to stick to your guns and get those rights back yeah. yourself. I remember this was in like the early 2000s, looking at some of the contracts we did. We almost always, if someone asked for the audiobook rights, we were almost always like, yeah, okay, you can have them. Or maybe there would be like a two year delay or something. And yeah. I, it's really hard to keep audio rights today. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's not, yeah, I mean, and, and that's another thing is that a lot of times there will be language in there. That's pretty much it's catch all language where it says, um, you know, any, not only do we get the rights to all of the publishing methods that we currently, that currently exist, but anything that comes up down the line, anything that's invented later, um, we get to do, you know, we get those rights too. So sometimes people push back on that because they, you know, they want an opportunity to negotiate that later. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing that people can say, hey, I want to limit the rights that I'm granting you to just these things. And if something else comes up that you want to exercise, then we write in the agreement that we have to mutually agree to it and come to terms on it. So even if you don't grant them the rights to it up front, you can still make them feel better about it by saying, you know, I will negotiate those in good faith with you if and when that happens down the road. Yeah. John asks, who pays for cover art and who picks the final design? Should be the publisher, probably. Um, the publisher, I mean, again, it, it's, it differs depending on who you're working with, but in my experience, the publisher 
paid for the art and the publisher wanted the final say in the how everything kind of came together as well. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because they should have a lot of expertise in that area. They should kind of have a sense of what's going to do well and what isn't going to do well. But it's also, I think, fair for them to give you a chance to look at things and weigh in as well, because you may have some very strong feedback. Um, I know that it's kind of a publisher's worst nightmare to have um, an author who gets approval over a bunch of stuff. Um, they try to avoid that as much as they possibly can. Yes. <laughs> but but sometimes you can you can swing that. And obviously, if you're a first time author, if, you, if this is your first time publishing, you don't have as much leverage as if you're, you know, a, a big name who sells millions of books, you, you're probably going to be able to sign, you know, you're going to have final say over everything. So for the most part, um, yeah. but yeah, for the, usually the publisher will pay for it. And because they're paying for it, they also want to approve it. For those who might want to know like the finer details of this, the clause I always saw agents use was like the right to consult on things meaningful consultation yeah yeah like yeah you can have final approval but the author wants meaning meaningful consultation so yeah. um I, that's that's kind of that vague language that we talked about but um <laughs> sometimes that's yeah. the best you can get i know as an editor we often when we went through the cover design process everyone was always looking back at the contract to see okay what language did they put in when do we have to show them do they have the consult language <laughs> and so i mean we did pay attention to it we didn't just wave it off okay yeah uh, and and that that is another thing quickly for people to keep in mind is that sometimes publishers will agree to things that they really don't have a way to um, actually give you. They'll, you know, so you, I don't even know where to go with that. So maybe I shouldn't have even said it, but um, sometimes if they say no to something, it's because they are not set up to accommodate it. They do not have the workflow in place to give you that thing that you want. Um, I remember one thing that often came up is authors or they're usually it was their agents, not the authors. They would want some sort of right of approval over some sort of foreign rights sale or, or, or some sort of deal that would be like struck at Frankfurt Book Fair or London Book Fair. And it's like, I can't stop this deal to call the author and the agent to have their OK. That's the one I remember. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, there may be sometimes people can get away with it. So here's my thing. If people were asking for tricky changes and I thought like, oh, this is, I would, let's say it was related to subrights. I would go to our subrights director and I'd say, hey, what is the likelihood that this is going to be an active title for you? Oh, nobody's going to be interested in that. Okay, well, then I'm going to just, you know, give them these changes because yeah. it's low risk for me and it <laughs> makes them feel better <laughs> about the, the overall contract. So. Uh, so here's actually a, a sub rights question from Sean. He's wondering if you can speak to terms, what they would might look like if you're licensing, let's say, a science fiction novel to the Spanish market or a, a German publisher. What do foreign language rights sales look like? They usually have a set term. Um, it's generally like a five year term, but then they do often have the the, the foreign publisher has the right to extend it um, for, you know, a year at a time after that. Um, usually, oh, sorry, there's a dog fight going on outside that sounds crazy. Um, so usually the, there are two, two types of sub rights deals. There are royalty inclusive and royalty exclusive deals. So usually what's going to what you're going to see is a royalty exclusive where the Spanish publisher says, okay, I'm going to use your files, your digital files, translate the work, print our own copies. This is about how many we're going to print. This is where we're going to, this is where we're going to price it. And based on those numbers, we're going to pay you an advance, you the publisher in advance. 
of such and such dollar amount. Um, the other version of that is where the publisher handles the printing for the, the foreign publisher, sells them the books inclusive of royalty. So it's just one big flat fee. We're going to sell you, you know, 2000 copies. You're going to pay, you know, 335 a book. Um, and, and that's it. There will be no royalties beyond that. In either case, the author gets a cut of that. If it's the royalty exclusive, where there is a royalty advance and then royalties eventually once the advance is paid back, the author will should get at least 50% of that advance and of any royalties that come in later. If it's the royalty inclusive deal, the your royalty as the author is probably going to be anywhere from five to ten percent of whatever the author made the publisher makes on that deal. Um, but again, those those agreements are a little more limited. They're typically five year terms. And um, you know, here's another thing to keep in mind when it comes to termination language in your agreement. If you if there are active licenses out there, the publisher cannot cannot cancel those licenses. So you may get back rights to your book, except for let's say there's a French edition that's going to be active for two more years. You know, the publisher may say, okay, we can give you back all of the rights except for French. Um, so some of the, sometimes those things kind of hang out there for a while. Did that answer his question? Yeah, perfect. Um, we're at the top of the hour. Are you okay continuing with more questions? If this is helpful, if people still have questions, I'm happy to do it. it is. Okay, so we've got the question I expected uh, from several people about what's a reasonable advance or how negotiable... How, how negotiable is that advance? And I'll just offer a general range from my experience and then Suzanne, you can jump in. I think if you're working with a big five publisher, which probably means you have an agent, or at least I hope you do, you're gonna likely see a bigger advance that's somewhere in the five figures. Let's just say mid five figures, the agent's probably hoping for six figures. Um, if it's a multi-book deal, you'll, you'll probably get into the six figures. Um, if it's not a big New York publisher, probably four figures, it might be low five figures, but I would say somewhere between 10 and 20,000 is highly average. Um, that doesn't mean that's what you're going to receive, but that's like just regardless of genre or who you are, if it's your first book and no one knows how you're going to perform, that's kind of what my expectation would be. What do you think, Suzanne? Based on what I see, um, and again, I am talking to authors who don't have representation. They are not going to one of the big publishers. They're going to a more of a mid-level. I'm seeing zero to 5,000. Occasionally it gets up there to, you know, six, you know, um, up to 10, but usually it's zero to five. And I will say that I, I believe everybody that I've worked with that asked for more money did get more money. That, that's why it's important that you ask for it. Because if you don't ask for it, you definitely will not get it. If you ask for it, there's a good chance you will get at least something above what they originally offered you. Here's a really interesting question from Suresh. Uh, is it reasonable to ask for higher royalties for sales that the author generates? But of course, this raises the question that he then asks, how would you track the author generated sales? So they could do an affiliate link. You know, that's one way to do it. <clears throat> I would say if you're helping them drive sales, I would have a conversation with them about, hey, how can I, how can we set this up so that I am more uh, motivated to do this? especially if you're someone who has a, if you're some sort of influencer, if you've got a big following, you should definitely be having conversations with your publisher prior to signing the contract to talk about ways in which you can kind of partner to benefit both of you. 
And that could be, you could, you could have some sort of arrangement that um, they can sales that come to them through a certain avenue that they can track to you. They, you know, you never know. Yeah. I had in my experience, one or two authors who actually wanted to join the print run and then have their own copies. These were people who already had businesses where they were used to selling things direct and or speaking Mm -hmm. and they had the books in the back of the room. And so they were able to buy the books at cost. Um, which in those days was maybe one to two dollars a copy. And that was their way of earning more money off of sales that they generated. Yes. If they are doing an initial print run, talk to them to find out if you can get, you can get run on pricing, which is just, it's, it's an additional, you know, um, and your, and your husband can actually probably speak Mm -hmm. to that Mm -hmm. with his production experience. He probably handled run on stuff. Um, but yeah, you, you know, we have definitely had contracts. I've dealt with contracts where we have had language like that, where they got, um, they bought up front and they got a really great deal on it. Now you may have, depending on where those books are printed, you might be responsible for shipment. You know, if they're printed in like Hong Kong, for example, you might have to put some of that expense into getting them to your door. Um, and that can be kind of pricey, but you know, it's, it's still the math probably would work out in your favor. There's a question here about contracts with the big five. So that's like the Harper Collins and Simon Schuster's of the world. Uh, can you talk about contracts with them with the publishing goal of advancing or establishing a literary career? That's a big question. Um, yeah, <laughs> that is very big. I mean, I would say just off the bat, you're, if it's your first contract and depending on who your agent is, there are a lot of things that you give up, like a big five. As of today, I'm not sure they would sign a contract with you unless you were willing to give up print, ebook, audio rights, and God knows what else. Um, but of course, your agent is really instrumental in negotiating the best deal possible. Um, I'll add just on a personal note, I find that most people want to transition from small publisher to big publisher after having an outstanding success. So like there was recently um, the author of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies short story collection, uh, Philia is her name, and that short story collection blew off the doors in terms of sales for West Virginia University Press. And for her next book deal, she's She's signed with the big five. It's like, I think a seven figure deal for her next two books. So I often see that transition happen. It's less common for me to see someone go from a big five to a smaller press because they really like the upfront money. So usually I think people like the big five because they think they're going to get more marketing and promotion. They think, who knows if that'll happen. And they want the money. They like, they want the money in hand upfront. Um, so I'll pause there if, if you have anything you want to add? I mean, that's an, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment because I could see someone working with a big publisher, having a book that does really, really well, but wanting more control. Maybe there might be a medium sized publisher who would love the cachet of having that author on their list and would be willing to actually give that author more money than they've ever paid anybody before and, and give them concessions on, you know, all kinds of control stuff. So, you know, you never know. Yeah. I've also seen um, self-published authors who are very successful um, sign with very specific imprints at big publishers. Like the example I'm thinking of is Bloom Books, which is source books, partly owned by Penguin Random House. And Bloom Books specializes in signing self-publishing authors who can't get the print distribution they would like on their own. And so that's been a really fascinating thing to watch um, because they're getting to to have a hybrid approach and play kind of both sides where they have the control over ebook and and often audio, but they're letting the the traditional publisher take the print one and often different cover designs. Um, it's, It's just very interesting to me. Okay, so uh, Andrea asks, if the contract's terminated and I get my rights back, 
am I back to querying to get a new publisher? I'm going to let you take that one. This is your, this <laughs> okay. is your area. I would say most times when you, if you've done that, it's to self-publish. It's to do it on your own because most publishers, I mean, if the, if the, if the publisher it was with decided to let it go, chances are there's not much of a market left for a traditional publisher to be interested in. There are exceptions. Um, so I'll, obviously there's some con it's context dependent. Um, but usually at what I see is authors putting it out onto the market themselves. Uh, there's also a publisher called Open Road Media founded by the other Jane Friedman, not by me, that specializes in backlist reissues. And so if you're an author of some reputation or if you have a significant catalog, back catalog, and I'm talking like you have multiple titles, like say half a dozen at least, um, they might be a good choice for bringing those books back into the market, especially on the digital side. All right, there are quite a number of questions that I'm just going to kind of lump together into one discussion area about marketing. Um, so I'll read some of these out and we can, we can chat. Um, Stacy wonders how much of the social media or promotional support is ne negotiable for a debut author. Um, Susan, Susan wonders if the publisher might contractually ask you to take on burdens or costs regarding marketing. Is this typical? Is it a red flag? Um, and then just like a potpourri of questions about what can you really expect to be mentioned in the contract on a marketing and promotion basis? That's uh, a good question. Um, it, it kind of, it's kind of all over the place. Um, as far as costs, them asking you to take some of the costs on, there may be some things that you personally that are really important to you to do from a marketing perspective, whether it's attending a particular conference, it may be something that they wouldn't normally pay for, but they say, hey, if you want to send yourself to that conference, we will support you in this other way. We will send books. We will have our, you know, marketing people coordinate stuff with you. Um, so they, there shouldn't be a situation where they come to you and say, here's our contract. We just need you to sign it and then give us $20,000 for marketing. That should not happen. But there may be a situation where there, where you have a conversation with them about marketing opportunities that are new to them or, you know, that are unique to your particular um, project and they may not be comfortable agreeing to foot the bill for that, but they, you may be able to work something out with them where, where you kind of partner and you each, you know, can make some contribution to it. Yeah. What was the other part of that question? I think there's mainly just a lot of questions about what you can really add to the contract that would either hold the author's feet to the fire or the publisher's feet to the fire and make sure that after two years have passed or however long, you know, since the yeah. signing that they actually do what they said. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can, you know, if they don't have any, any language about marketing in the agreement, again, I advise that early on you ask them to kind of give you a rundown of their typical marketing um, approach. And you should try to formalize that in writing and add it to the contract as some sort of, you know, um, like, hey, the, the publisher agrees to provide marketing and promotion based on the, um, on the marketing plan attached kind of thing. Um, again, it's, it's, you know, they're probably going to write it in such a way if they agree to it, they're going to write it in such a way where they, Hey, they have some leeway. Mm -hmm. Um, it's hard to get them to, and another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, from the time you submit your manuscript to the time that they're promoting it and the book is published, a lot can change. Yeah. So sometimes it's difficult to agree to a particular approach that, early on um, because you don't really know if you're going to be able to, to do that right. when the time comes. Right. Um, you know, in my experience, there were times that we, you know, I know there was one author in particular who had done a number of books for us 
they had sold very well. So we definitely, you know, wanted to work with her and wanted her to feel good about the con the, the new contracts we were signing. And there was a, we had a change in our publicity team that she did not really care for. And we agreed to hire a particular publicist that she liked on a freelance basis to promote her book when the time came. So we put that in the contract. Unfortunately, the people on the who were working on the book did not really understand <laughs> that that meant they needed to do that. And so they hired someone else to do it. And that ended up causing some problems that I needed to, it was a little bit of a mess that needed to be cleaned up. But um, so there are times that you can ask for something to be added, and then you just need to follow up with them to make sure that they're doing it. Um, yeah. But again, you, you know, if you don't ask, it's not going to happen for sure, but you can, you should have that conversation with them. This is just anecdotal, but um, when I was listening to a panel at the U.S. Book Show this past summer, there was some conversation about this and how I think there's been maybe some more, more resistance over time to promising anything marketing-wise because people feel like the landscape is changing too quickly and they don't want to be tied into doing things that they feel are no longer effective. So they want flexibility and to be able to jump yeah. on things that are appropriate for that book at that time because book publishing so slow. Um, you just can't be confident that what worked at the time you signed it is going to be meaningful at publication. Just look at Twitter. I mean, if anyone had made Twitter promises two years ago, that's kind of um, not meaningful any longer. So at least in my estimation. Okay. <clears throat> I don't want to keep you too much longer. So I'm just looking for a question that might be good for us to close out on. Hold on. This, I think this is a good one to end on because I have some suggestions and you might have some suggestions. Angela is wondering if there is a particular website, organization, resource, book where you can look at a sample book contract. There are several of those out there, I believe. There was one that I used to use all the time, and I haven't looked lately to see if there's a new edition out, but there was um, the Kirsch's Guide to the Book Contract. Yes. Have you ever looked at that one? Yeah. Yeah. I always found that one to be extremely valuable. Um, and again, but it's anything like that, you have to have some flexibility. You can't necessarily look at those those sample clauses and say, this is exactly what I want because the publisher may not be able to actually give you that, but it's a great place to start and understand, um, you know, what things mean. Yeah. Um, the Authors Guild recently made their model contract available for free to everyone. You don't have to be a member, so you can find that at their website. Um, the Science Fiction Writers of America also has a model book contract that's very useful, as well as some other model contracts. I think they have an agent author contract. They have like, um, if you're planning an anthology or something, I think they have contracts for that. So they're a rich resource as well. Um, and then I think just asking around, seeing if authors are willing to share. Um, I, it's it's sad to me that it's kind of a taboo for authors to really share contractual arrangements, especially if, if you have an agent, they're going to tell you not to do that. Um, but I do think it helps a lot if everyone compares notes and see, see what you, other people were able to get and copy, copy the language. I mean, that's how I learned uh, at F and W, especially from you, Suzanne, just seeing what you would put into the contract, seeing what the agents would put into the contract, and you start to see the differences in how people attack the the problems yeah. or the things that they want. Yeah, and I actually have quite a collection of <laughs> of contracts, and I have them from you know various sizes and types of publishers, including the big ones. And I have been working on compiling samples of, I, I basically want to do a compilation of all of the various contract clauses and have people be able to see how different publishers approach it. Of course, I would put, I would keep any identifying information out of it. So you wouldn't necessarily know 
which contract belongs to which publisher. And some of them are older, some of them are more current, but um, I, I do think it's kind of interesting to see how, how first of all, how, how many similarities there are across the board and then also the differences, so. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Okay, um, Mark, my husband just shared in the chat uh, a link to your Facebook page for your business, Suzanne. He's also shared your email address. I'm just, Thank everyone, you. if you would like to, consult with Suzanne on a contract or a deal or an offer of any kind, please reach out to her. She is open for business. Um, I will put her contact information as well in the follow-up email that you'll all receive if you lose track of that. And also with the recording that's going to go up on YouTube shortly, we'll include her contact information there. So you're sure to have it. Thank you and Mark both. I will say that my social media is a little on the sad side. I really have done <laughs> little to nothing with it. I, I'm hoping to change that in the near future. But if you have any questions about anything that we talked about during this chat, if you email me, I will I will get back to you with an answer. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Really appreciate your time and sharing your thank many you. years of insight. And thank you all for joining me today. And I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye, Bye.